Are you looking to increase your sales and boost your selling abilities to the max? Welcome to the Continuous Sales Improvement Podcast with best-selling author Eric Lofholm. Eric has trained over 10,000 students, and they have generated over $500 million in sales increases over the last 20 years. One thing he understands is that being a lifelong learner is key to your sales success. Every week, Eric Lofholm interviews elite sales and business professionals and discovers what helps make them the legend they are today. Hi, this is Eric Lofholm. I want to welcome all of you to episode number one of the Continuous Sales Improvement Podcast. And I'm so excited to have my mentor and friend of many years, Tony Martinez, as our first guest. Tony, how are you doing today? Doing fantastic, Eric. It's great to be here. Awesome. So a little background about, about Tony. I met Tony back in 1992, and he was really instrumental at teaching me sales early on in my career, helping me with public speaking, and he's really had a, a profound impact on my life as a mentor and a friend. He's also a very successful business owner and a family man, a great husband, and is just an all-around great human being. And I, I was excited to have the opportunity to have Tony come on here and share some of his golden nuggets with us. So Tony, share with us a little bit of background about you so the listeners can get connected to you. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, born and raised here in Sacramento. Um, and, you know, as far as my, my business career, you know, my, my real big break was, you know, working for Dante Perano. And uh, I've been in this industry now for over, th- since 1990, so for my 31st year of being in this industry of public speaking, sales, marketing, promotion, mentoring, training, developing trainings, and you know, everything to do with, <clears throat> with uh, information sales industry, real estate investing. Um, you know, so that's really been, you know, prior to that, you know, I didn't really have much of a background. Yeah. And um, never from college. Yep. Yeah. What would you say, Tony, is your your best business increasing or sales increasing idea? Well, there's, uh, you know, from a business perspective, you know, one of the things, you know, there's a lot of, you know, most organizations, you know, are their sales driven, you know, their sales and marketing driven. The, the revenue comes from sales. And what I've recognized is um, a lot of people um, just their sales are one-offs. And what I mean by that is um, like, for example, I know of organizations right now and they do a lot of online marketing and they sell something online. Uh, they create a customer, sell a person, that customer or something. And that's a- about it. Um, what I, one of the greatest um, revenue driving business building aspect of our business today uh, has really revolved around how do you increase revenue without increasing expenses? Um, and what that does is, and I'll give you an example. So if we have someone become a client and they invested $1,500 into our, into our introductory training, um, well, when I, I've, I've generated revenue and then when I come back and I have something of value to offer that same client again, right. Then I've generated revenue without necessarily increasing, uh, expenses. They, they increase a little bit, but not very much. And if I can have something of value to bring to that client again, that they have an interest in, then I can increase revenue again um, without increasing expenses. And then over a period of time, when you've built this database like we have right now, um, we have multiple campaigns that, um, let's say we have our California uh, client base, and um, let's say there's 5,000 people in California who are our clients today, and I have a campaign that I run that runs to that, to that group of clients and it generates revenue, uh, but it doesn't necessarily increase my expenses month. What I, what I look to do is not only continue to generate revenue, but I look to build campaigns, uh, marketing campaigns that are not one-offs. I, 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 you know, at this stage of my career, I refuse to do a one-off. So when I build a campaign, my plan is for that campaign to run at least five years before I have to touch it again. So all I'm really doing is building this campaign to generate revenue and I'm just pouring customer, I'll pour my California customers in there, then I'll pour my Nevada customers in there, then I'll pour my you know, Texas customers in there, my Florida customers. And so it's just one campaign generating revenue over time. And then what I can do is I can come back 
to California again and hit all the people who didn't buy the first time. So I'm still continuing to generate revenue from a campaign that I built one time. So those that are- is an incredible concept, Tony. I, I think a lot of uh, salespeople, business owners, entrepreneurs, uh, they're doing one-offs. Like they have this certain yeah. problem and they look to solve the problem with a one-off marketing campaign. And uh, right. to have that vision, that's a very, very unique insight. Yeah, it's uh, it's a game changer, really, if you think about it. Yeah, absolutely. And w- one thing that I, I know about you, Tony, that's, I think, very um, different than most entrepreneurs is the level of detail that you have when you put these sales and marketing campaigns together. Could you just briefly speak about um, how how detailed you get when you're putting together your strategy? Boy, Um so detailed that there isn't any one person in my organization that it does not drive nuts. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, it's painstaking. Um, you know, f- when you, when you think about the fact that what a campaign really is, it's a way to influence other people to enroll for one of your programs for us anyways, uh, one of our trainings, one of our events, one of our, uh, products or services. And what that means is the, the only way to influence someone online is is through your copy, your words. If your uh, campaign doesn't have words in it, then what's gonna happen is you're not gonna have a campaign that produces. And so understanding that um, every single word matters, you know, most people don't look at it that way. Uh, Most people, when it comes to sales, they're very lazy in language. Uh, They're not precise uh, at all. And that, that will produce mediocre sales, but it'll never produce the highest top level sales possible. So I painstakingly um, will um, think through, you know, for one email, it might take me one full day just to come up with the subject lines for that email. Um, The subject lines can never be designed until the email is designed. And the subject line has, you know, the bottom line is this, if you have an online campaign and it's email driven, if that it, it could be the, the baddest, most converting campaign ever possible. But if the email doesn't get opened, uh, it doesn't matter. So f- first and foremost, for me, um, the single most important, once the campaign is, is developed, the single most important uh, piece of that campaign has to be uh, the subject line. And the vast majority of people I know in business, um, I don't care how big or small the company is, uh, they are very lazy in their, in their subject lines. Uh, we are absolutely the opposite. We, um, you know, for one email, I might have 10 or 11 different subject lines that I'm going to test all 11 of them. Um, I'm going to test, uh, I'm gonna test that subject line and uh, we'll, I'm going to test that subject line in a manner that's like, we'll test that subject, a series of subject lines in the first email. We'll test that those same subject lines in the second email, see if it produces better in first position or second position. What I'm going to end up with over about 30 days of just testing subject lines not only the best subject lines that produce, but where they produce best. Does it produce best in email number one, one email number two, email number three, or email number four, or email number five? Um, just because it produces, it might produce extraordinary in email number one, but not very good in email number three, or it may not do very well in email number one, but it does extraordinary in email number three. Um, so just a su- you know, that's just subject lines. Um, you know, the, the level of testing that we do on subject lines just to come up with the right formula uh, for which subject line is first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, or possibly sixth, depending on how many emails are in the campaign. Um, you know, to write one email um, in my campaigns that uh, I'm looking for, you know, kind of what I call infrastructure campaigns, where it's going to become part of our infrastructure that I don't have to touch in the future. Uh, man, I, I mean, I've spent as much as a week um, or longer on one email, just, you know, writing the email out, coming back, revisiting it, um, you know, speaking it out loud to see how it sounds when I speak it out loud, moving this paragraph up and this paragraph down, adding graphics, taking out graphics, um, having some emails that when they click it, it goes to a video, having some emails that click and don't go to a video, long form, short form, um, of the same version of emails, um, and then we'll come up, then same thing, you know, we will do the same thing. We'll put this email in uh, as our first email. We'll put this email as, uh, email as our second email. Then we'll switch them around and see which produces best. Um, 
and then we'll come up with a formula for the emails as well. This one's best in first position. This one's best second. This one's best third. This one's best fourth. This one's best fifth. This one's best sixth. Um, you know, and that's just the emails. Then when they click the emails, do we want it to go to a long? <laughs> uh, do we want it to go to a long form uh, landing page or a short form landing page? And so we'll test both. Uh, so email number one will go to the long form and the short form, whichever produces best. That's where it goes to. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's it. Um, you know, then we have a direct mail campaign that will coincide with the email campaign and the direct mail campaign. We'll test uh, the direct mail where they we have uh, some information in the email or in the letter, send them to the, to a landing page. And does it work better to the long form, or the short form with the video, without the video? Um, and we'll come up with a formula for a direct mail campaign, which data, you know, what's the, what's the best day to send it at? We'll test different days, two weeks before, one week before, 10 days before. Um, as well, because sometimes if it's too far out, you get a bunch of registrations, but then you get too big of a drop off before they get there. So we just look to optimize show up rate um, as well. Um, then we'll combine that with a uh, text message campaign layered in there as well. Um, and the text message campaign, as it, it's you know, obviously very short uh, message, drives them to the landing page as well. And we've tested out, do we do that on day one? Do we do it on day two? Do we do it on day three? Do we do uh, one text message on day one, one text message? We, don't, we never do more than three text messages in a campaign because we don't want to blast, um, make that overuse. Uh, all of our campaigns right now only use two text messages, uh, one, on one, one on day two and one on day three uh, is what's been working best for us. What time to send out the text message? Uh, early in the morning does not work. Uh, better in the afternoon. Uh, we've tested nine in the morning. We've tested... Uh, 12 noon, we've had to three in the afternoon, uh, two or three in the afternoon works best for us right now. Um, let me jump in, Tony, for just a second. Uh, brilliant answer. And, and I think for all of you listening, you know, part of the idea behind the podcast is for me to bring guests on that have, you know, incredible expertise and they can share with you their blueprints and Tony's conveying to you the level of detail and preparation that he has. I, I honestly don't know any other entrepreneur that prepares at his level in sales and marketing. And it's, you know, it's made a massive difference in his results. And I want you to just speak to what you just said, but from one other different, a different angle, some of the people listening, maybe they're doing, you know, email campaigns, they might be doing uh, marketing text campaigns, like what you're describing. A lot of people listening, they're delivering a sales presentation. So prior to you doing marketing for an entire company, if you go back to when you and I met, you know, we were right. both selling uh, for Dante Pirano and you, right. but you had the same mindset around preparation for a sales presentation. So could you just speak to how much preparation when you're putting together a 60, 90 minute sales presentation, how much preparation do you do? Gee, I mean, if, if is a pre it depends. So is the presentation already created or not created yet? <laughs> Let's say it, somebody's it, watching, do it in this context. They sell insurance, they sell real estate, they have a repetitive presentation correct. that they're delivering, but I think most people just wing it. They do. So give them the insight. You you probably have prepared as much or more than any anybody, any sales professional in the world at mastering your presentation. So just give the, the people listening or watching this insight into what is what does mastery of preparation really look like from what you actually did? Right. Um, so if if I was gonna give a presentation on a Saturday, for, for example, um, let's say I gave a presentation on Saturday. I mean, the first thing I would do when I gave, whenever I gave a presentation, if I was giving a presentation to a group and maybe they're, they're not giving a presentation to a group, but they're just giving a presentation to an individual, maybe that's a face-to-face -face presentation or a, uh, or a presentation over Zoom or over the phone right now. Um, first thing I would always do after a presentation is I would write down every single objection that that person gave me. Um, every single negative comment, every single objection, uh, that they had, I would write down because I'm going to get that those objections again in the future. And over a period of time, you get a core set of objections that you're going to get every single time. And you get to the point where there is not going to be a question that you could ask or objections that you come across that you have not heard before. Well, the best thing, you know, the, most people just, even though they've heard that objection a million times, they've never really sat down and scripted out. They give an answer, but here's, here's the better way to look at it. What's the best answer? 
right? What's the best answer? You know, not not what is a good answer, not how do you respond, but have you really sat down with that objection and really thought through what is the most effective way to address that objection? And as you know, Eric, uh, most of the time there isn't one effective way. It depends on who you're speaking to, right? And so if the person is a single mom and it's a money objection, it's a big, bigger difference it's different than if it's a couple who has a, two kids in college and it's a money objection. Um, so understanding how to respond to different people that you would be speaking to in those objections is, is um, an absolute, in my, again, there's a big difference between making sales and making the, being a top producing salesperson. And so being prepared that way was, all, was always uh, a big one for me. And if I gave a presentation live and I, let's say there was a hundred people in the room and the minute, every single minute, the last person walked out the door, I would sit down with maybe there's three or four staff members there. And I would ask them, what was every single objection that you received today? And I would make a list of all of them. And I did that for every single presentation until I had every objection that I was possibly going to get for that particular presentation. And then what I figured out is not just ways to overcome that objection when I was speaking to people face to face, the most effective way to overcome that objection is to answer it in the presentation to begin with, right? So I would have a case study, um, and, and an actual real case study. I would comb through all of our success stories, and I would find case studies that would actually overcome the object objection in the body of the presentation. So that when I finished my presentation, they could ask that they could come up with that objection again. They could ask that question, and now I have something to point to, rather than just responding. Uh, so that was another thing as far as just you know because that's that's let what me we're just jump doing. in for, for one moment sure. so as far as how much time when you put together say uh the land talk for for dante's uh, yeah. audience how many hours would you say you spent crafting the script practicing the script you know over and over and over is it did you spend 10 hours to put that presentation together? Was it 50 hours? Was it 100 hours? Was it over 100 hours? Over 100 hours. I mean, there's no question. It was over 100 hours to craft the presentation and get it to where I wanted it. Okay, now, so once I, I had to think about this, okay? You're a real estate agent. How many hours have you spent crafting your presentation? You know, a lot of people just wing it. They haven't spent any time. And here we have, you know, one of the most prepared, if not the most prepared person at putting presentations together in Tony Martinez. And he's saying not what you should do, but what he actually did. He had a repetitive presentation. He was delivering it over and over and over again. And he spent over a hundred hours doing it. Now I'm not necessarily advising you go spend a hundred hours, but how about spend five, right? Spend five hours preparing or 10 hours on a presentation that you're going to deliver over and over and over again for the rest of your life. Now, Tony, we could go much deeper into presentation skills, but yeah. I want to I want to get to a question about adversity. And I know okay. that you have um, different times in your life that you've gone through challenge, setback, adversities. And I wanted to know, you know, everyone watching right now, they've had their setbacks and maybe they feel like they're alone. Nobody's gone through what they've gone through. You know, right. here you're, you're, you know, massively successful entrepreneur and business owner, family man. But tell us about a time when you had a setback and what did you learn from it? Um, well, my biggest setback was when NASI, our first company that went out of business. I mean, there was no bigger setback in my life, uh, financially, especially, uh, than that business failure. You know, we, I went from a company that was generating, uh, $15 million a year in business to, uh, going bankrupt, um, filing, filing for bankruptcy. I went from driving a $150,000 911 twin turbo Porsche to having no car at all. Um, to not having a bank account, no credit cards, uh, phone turned off. Um, you know, did anything that could be turned on was turned off. <laughs> Any accounts that could be open were closed. Um, I slept on my cousin's floor for eight months, uh, borrowed his car to try to get back up on my feet. Um, and, uh, you know, there was no, <laughs> you know, prior to that and, and after that, there's no been no bigger business failure, um, no bigger failure. Uh, impacting failure in my life. Um, and I, I don't know that I've ever been through anything so tough uh, as, as what I went through there. You know, it wasn't just losing every nickel I had. It wasn't, it was, you know, going to less than zero 
uh, being $2.8 million in debt and having to file for personal bankruptcy as well as corporate bankruptcy, um, <laughs> you know, is a challenge, you know, super challenging time for sure. Wow. So you went from 15 million in revenue down to zero, went from a, from a elite, you know, Porsche to no car at all, lost everything. What's, what's, I'm sure there's hundreds of lessons from that, but what's one thing you learned from that, um, in, in, incredibly, uh, challenging experience? Uh, it was a business failure. I wasn't a failure. Uh, it was one big thing is you have to distinguish, um, because your business fails doesn't mean you're a failure. Uh, I was broke, uh, but I wasn't broken as a human being. Um, I knew for a fact that um, I didn't unlearn everything that got me there. I didn't unlearn public speaking. I didn't unlearn sales. I didn't unlearn marketing. I didn't unlearn all the skill sets that I had up until that point. I didn't unlearn any of those. And so um, keeping those intact, I understood um, that I couldn't stay in that position forever. Uh, there was no, I, and quite honestly, you know, my perspective shifted pretty quickly. And I thought, wow, this is going to be a badass story to tell in the future. <laughs> you know, I, I really, really believed I couldn't wait to tell the story. I didn't know, I didn't know what the story was going to be. All I knew the part of the story was going to be, I was broke. I lost every, I, you know, I had everything, lost everything. And then I'm back again. I didn't know what, what back again looked like. Yeah. I didn't know what back again was going to be, but I knew I wanted to tell that story at some point in the future. Yeah. Do you remember the um, nugget that, again that, that you, you said about, um, you, you said, was it your business fail, but you were not a failure. Correct. Guys, yeah, there's two, I mean, there's two things. That's a huge nugget. You know, if you've gone through a divorce and you're feeling like a, a failure or you're feeling less than, or maybe you went through a bankruptcy, I've gone through a bankruptcy too. Tony, and I both have. Um, if you've lost the business, um, if you maybe made an investment and you, you lost your investment or your credit score tanked, um, that's a great golden nugget that Tony just shared. And hopefully that uplifted, uplifted at least one of you that is listening. Tony, let's go to the next question here. In, in five minutes or less, what was a success you've had in your life? And maybe a couple of the golden nuggets that you got out of like something you've done in your life that was successful. And you can give us a couple of couple of pointers, kind of like what you're talking about with the sales presentation. The golden nugget was preparation. What's something else that you've had a success on in your life that you could share with us? Well, I, I think really a big one right now is because the circumstance we went, we're in with this pandemic and everything that's been going on over the past year. Yeah. Um, you know, in, instantly, you know, we went from, you know, um, the revenue that we generated was seven figures a month um, to zero revenue and not able to generate revenue because we were 100 percent revenue driven by our live events. So everything from our seminars to our trainings to our one-on-one -on -one consultations to everything we did, you know, every, every revenue generating source was shut down. Um, so we had no choice, but to either do one of two things, you know, and, and it was uh, questionable in the beginning because no one knew what, what the future looked like, um, whether we would even, we would still be in business. So um, one of the main things that I, I had to do at that point is I really had to take inventory of what my skill sets are. What am I good at? What are my expertise and how am I going to use them moving forward? Um, what is, you know, and then the, the second thing I did is I made a list of the sharpest people I knew in business. Um, and that list consisted of a gentleman by the name of Tony Jerry, uh, who's a mentor of mine, business coach, CEO coach, one of the top CEO coaches in the country. Um, included another gentleman, uh, Joseph Janicek, who owns one of the largest, uh, most successful uh, private wealth management firms in the country. Um, and I hand selected uh, people to, to meet with over the phone and via Zoom and strategize with immediately uh, to see what they were doing, what they suggested we should do. Um, and so I really leaned on some really, really sharp people um, as well. And I just was constantly strategizing and um, looking at what my, you know, the other thing was, you know, I had to look at what, what are my resources? What are my people resources? What are my human resources, I should say? Uh, what are my financial resources? Um, what, who, you know, who are my vendors? Who are my colleagues? Who are my uh, business associates? And what what resources do I have? And I just kind of put all that together to come up with a plan on what's next. Uh, but I will tell you, man, when that pan pandemic hit, 
I met with my staff and just like when we failed in, when I failed in business all those years ago, I had an ultimate resolve and that resolve was this. Uh, you put me in a position where out of my control, right, out of anything that I could do, um, you forced that upon me. And because of that, I'm going to come back stronger. Uh, I don't care what it takes, um, but I am not going to just get through. I'm not just going to survive this pandemic. I'm going to come out bigger, better, stronger than we've ever been. And that was a meeting and a promise that I made to my staff. And that's exactly what we did. Um, wow. So you went from seven figures in monthly revenue down to zero. Zero. Yeah. And there's a great golden nugget that, that Tony shared. I hope you guys heard it. And that was reaching out to advisors, right? When we have a problem, yeah. how good, all of you listening or watching, how good are you at reaching out to advisors, people that are experts in an area of life and reaching out to them and saying, hey, I really need your help, you know, and uh, doing exactly <clears throat> what Tony did. And Tony's an incredibly smart individual, yet he saw value in reaching out to advisors to help put a plan together. And uh, and then you pivoted and now, you know, you guys are, you pivoted to the online strategy and, and things are going great. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. We're, we're actually right now, Percentage wise, we net more than we did prior to the pandemic. Wow. That there's very few businesses that can say that, except for maybe some businesses were enhanced by the I mean, pandemic, right? Because yeah. you know, yeah. they uh the no, we were not enhanced whatever. because of the pandemic. <laughs> but uh, our <laughs> industries, you know, no. very few people in our industry are are doing better than they were. Uh, yeah. so that's that's incredible. Um couple more questions, Tony. The next one here. Um, what is one way you've used repetition to improve or master a skill? Well, that's, you know, let's go back to public speaking. Um, you know, we were, we were having that conversation and, you know, like I said, you know, if I was going to give a presentation on a Saturday, I practiced all week long. The difference between the way I practice and the way other people think they're practicing for a presentation, like right now, people sit in front of their PowerPoint presentation, they're working on their slides and they're working on this and adjusting that. Um, I practice my full presentation out loud. So when I say out loud, exactly how you practice is how you play. Uh, so I didn't sit there and just go talk under my breath, sitting at my desk. I stood up as if I was on a stage and I practiced out loud um, with the same voice inflection, with the same force in my voice. Um, and and I did it all week long. So I, I had that that particular presentation back then. I had it broken down into modules. So I could I could think through the presentation if I wanted to work on just the close, right? and that was module 11, then I could actually sit in my car and actually out loud and just repeat module 11 over and over and over again. I could be in the shower and think through my presentation and and think of module four, which was a case study. And I could, out, you know, I could recite that module over and over and over and over and over again. Then I could just, you know, when I had time, just stand, sit in my apartment and recite the entire thing start to finish over and over and over again. And back then, you know, I was very self-conscious about, you know, I, I was a top producing public speaker, but I didn't want to lose that position. So for a lot of years, even when I was do, delivering two hour and two hour and 20 minute presentations, um, the morning before I spoke, I would deliver, I would get up in my hotel room and I would deliver that presentation out loud, the entire presentation all the way through one time before I would get up on stage that day. Um, so, you know, if I delivered that presentation, you know, 30 times during the week, um, then come Saturday, it's just 31. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For all of you listening, if you take what Tony did, right, he's not just giving advice. This is what he actually did. And you work on your presentation over and over and over. I mean, just listening to Tony right now is like motivating me to want to even work on my presentation even more. Uh, that's a big money making idea. And that's the whole purpose of this podcast is so you can get learn from experts like Tony Martinez, pick up the blueprints that he's sharing with us today so you can have a better life. Um, Tony, a couple last questions here. How do you like to learn? Do you read? Do you work with consultants? Do you attend seminars? Do you do Audible? What, what What's the way that you like to learn? All of those. <laughs> so, uh, Eric, as you know, I, I am a lifelong learner. So I'm always reading a book. 
I'm always listening to a, a book on audio right now. Uh, prior to the pandemic, um, I was in Strategic Coach, which is a high-level mastermind group. You know, it's a $25,000 a year mastermind group. Um, I'm in a mastermind group like that every single year. Um, Tony Jerry, as I mentioned, was one of my advisors. He's a personal friend and an advisor to me right now. Um, I don't listen to podcasts. I have, you know, I have a whole list of podcasts that I, I really respect to people who are, have the podcast, but I just can't seem to get into podcasts, quite honestly. Uh, I don't like watching videos online. Um, you know, I, I don't watch YouTube you know, presentations or anything like that. It's, I don't know why. It just does not. Um, it's just not the way I, I like to do it. Uh, you know, like Dante is a huge video guy, man. He just, uh, he sends me videos almost every single day from YouTube and I never even click on the link, uh, quite honestly, cause I just, <laughs> it's just not my way. It's not my way of doing it. Um, so yeah. So, you know, reading physical books, I like reading physical books because that gives me the opportunity to highlight everything that I like to make notes. And then I take those books and I give them to a transcriber and they tr transcribe it into a set of notes for me. So I've done that with hundreds of books over the years. Um, so those are my favorite. Those are my favorite ways to learn. Awesome. I think what Tony said is just this key. It's along the lines of what this podcast is about: being a lifelong learner, and we never stop learning. And uh, it's worked for Tony. Fantastic. Yep. So Tony, a couple of just rapid fire questions here. Um, is there a book right now that you're reading, or somebody that you you follow, or somebody you're learning from um, right now in your life? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a few books that, that um, I, I would recommend. One of them I read last year, but I think it's just such a, an extraordinary book. Everyone should read it. And it's called Atomic Habits. And I don't know if um, you've mentioned that or know of that book, but um, I've read so much on on habit formation. Um, and it is by far the best book I've ever read on. I, I've actually read it twice and listened to it twice. Um, I've read it twice physically and really listened to it twice. Um, it's that good. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a great book. Um, I, I read a um, a biography recently. Uh, it's called I think it's called How You Play the Game, How We Play the Game, something like that. It's the uh, um, I read that or I listened to that on audio uh, last year sometime. Um, but it's it's the uh, CEO of Dick Sporting Goods, and I, I really like listening to uh, success stories, uh, how other people did it. And you know, one of the things I typically is common denominator in all of those success stories is there's just a, a there's a resolve that that these guys and these people have that, you know, failure is not an option for them. Um, so I, I thought that was a great book. And then the last one, I'm, the one I'm reading right now or listening to right now is called Sea Stories by uh, Admiral McCracken. Um, he's uh, the highest ranking admiral ever that was a Navy SEAL. And uh, he has, he wrote a book called Make Your Bed that uh, was really popular New York Times bestseller. Um, but just a lot of great, a lot, a lot of great lessons uh, in, in those books as well. Awesome. Um, what's one goal that you have right now? Boy, I just want to, you know, I want to take where we're at in this particular business um, right now. And I want to build from here. Um, I, you know, my, what I had, you know, I have so many projects and so many goals on paper right now. Uh, what this pandemic has given me an opportunity to do is, is spend a lot of time strategizing again, again, meeting with some very sharp people and designing out a whole new future. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I'd really like to take what, just build upon where we're at right now and just continue to create this a, a juggernaut of an online marketing uh, business driving um, uh, the vast majority of all of our business online and then um, pivot that or, or tran transition that into some uh, live training events that I have a, a list of things that I would do. One of them is a, a project that I have with Dante and another one's a project that I have with Tony Jerry right now. Fantastic. Now, these last couple questions are more just so we can get to know you a little bit better. Uh, growing up, did you play a musical instrument? Nope. All right. Favorite mm -hmm. sports team? Um, you know, basketball is, has always been the Lakers and football has always been San Diego Chargers since I was in since I was a kid. Uh, those have always been my two favorite sports teams. All right. And singer and musical group that you like? Boy, so many. Mm -hmm. Um I'm a huge Santana fan. You know, I grew up listening to Santana. I grew up with a, an uncle and a cousin who played in a band. They played all, you know, salsa type style music. And they used to practice at our house. And, you know, nine out of 10 songs that they knew and played <laughs> was Santana. And I'm just a huge fan of his. Uh, and it's amazing that he puts out so much great music still this many, this many years later. He's 
Um, so he's one of them for sure. Um, I, I love this art, an artist, a female artist by the name of Erica Padu. Um, I, she's just, again, I've, been, I've had a, a crush on her for probably close to 30 years now uh, and her music. Yeah. Awesome. And what was her name again? Erica Badu, B-A-D-U. Awesome. She's I want to check that out. Yeah, uh, nice. Tony, is there anything you would like to um, offer the uh, people watching the podcast or the listeners? Is there any next step you'd like to recommend for them as far as your business? Um, I, you know, as far as my business, not necessarily, man. Um, my my be best recommendations is for people to recognize their value. Um, I think we all have to take a look at what what are our skill sets? What what you know? What expertise do we have? What resources do we have? What human resources do we have? Uh, what financial resources do we? Have? Who do we know? Um, and really, you know, when you can quantify all of that. It'll give you a lot more confidence on taking better actions, uh, understanding that, you know, we none of us escapes. Uh, well, es if, if you really go for it, I mean, if you really want to achieve dreams, none of us is going to stay escape setbacks. No, none, of us, none of us are going to escape hard work and none of us are going to escape um, temporary failures. How we respond to those, you know, that that's, you know, and one of the things, you know, Eric and you and I have talked about this before. You know, one of the things that I could always bank on, you know, in competition in our businesses um, and what we do for a living is I could always bank on the next person. The person next to me is laziness, their unwillingness to do what I was willing to do. And that always gave me a ton of confidence, man. I did, you know, that knowing that no, for, for a fact without exception, I don't give a shit who you are. Oh, sorry, man. I don't give a crap who you are. You know, I just uh, no one's going to outwork me. No one's going to no one's going to practice their presentation uh, more times than I am. Uh, no one's going to read more books. Uh, no one's going to no one's going to put as much time as I put into an email. No one's going to put as much time as I put into scripting out a, a, a promotional video. You know, and they're not going to outwork me. And because of that, I'm always going to surpass them. They're just, you know, compounded over time. They're not going to outwork me. And so the other thing is, you know, you know, at, at the point of frustration, you know, nine out of 10 people are going to quit. Uh, nine out of 10 people are going to start making excuses. Um, so. At the point of frustration, when, when I reach a point of frustration, I go, oh, that's that point where most people quit. I'm not quitting. And that's the point where people start to make excuses. I'm not making excuses. I'm going to keep going. Fantastic. Well, I want to acknowledge you, Tony, for being a great interview today and for being a mentor and a friend. And beyond that, I know that you show up powerfully for a lot of people in, uh, in your life and you've dedicated your life to making a difference in the lives of others. For those of you that are watching, I'd like you to um, acknowledge yourself for listening to this podcast. And the way I want you to do it, take your right hand if you're right handed, your left hand if you're left hand. I want you to pat yourself on the back and tell yourself, great job for listening to this podcast. I want you to encourage you to be your number one cheerleader. I also want to encourage you, if you really resonate with this podcast or anytime you find a piece of content that really resonates with you, I want you to watch or listen to it seven times. So if you were connecting with what Tony and I were sharing, watch or listen to this seven times. It's kind of an unusual request. The reason though I would advise you to do that is you can put these powerful ideas in your subconscious mind through the principle of auto-suggestion. This is episode one, and there'll be many, many future episodes and you can learn all about the different ways that you can watch or listen to the podcast and also about the future episodes by going to continuoussalesimprovement.com. When you go there, just hit the podcast button and you can find all the information about the podcast. I would love it if you would share this podcast with other people that you have in your network that can benefit from positive, successful ideas like this. Tony, thank you again for being a great guest, and this is our first episode. I'm so glad that it was you. It was an amazing interview, Tony. Awesome, Eric. Thank you for that, man. And and dude, just you're doing such great work out there, man. And I'm so uh, glad that we remain friends uh, over all these years. And super uh, super honored to be first on this, first on your podcast, man. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this episode, make sure and subscribe to get notified of new episodes each week. And check out our other great episodes by going to continuoussalesimprovement.com. That's continuoussalesimprovement.com. And while you're there, 
pick up chapter one totally free of my new book, Continuous Sales Improvement. Just opt in when you go to the website. Until next time, keep on improving. I'll see you in the next episode.